Clifton Bloomfield was always known as a bully. His parents forced him to undergo treatment for a schizophrenia diagnosis, but this didn't stop his violent behavior. He stole a motorcycle and robbed a church, and in 1989, he and his sister went on a robbery spree in Phoenix. Clifton got 13 years in prison, and his sister got 10 years. After being released in 2002, he was arrested again for armed robbery two years later. While he was on parole, he played an extra in a 2008 movie called Felon, but the film crew didn't know that they had a serial killer on the set. Welcome to History's Biggest Villains. Clifton Bloomfield was born on March 1969 in Kingman, Arizona. Even from a very young age, Clifton had problems with the law. In 1979, at age 10, he was arrested for shooting someone with a BB gun. After his arrest, the judge sentenced him to probation until his 18th birthday. After being returned home to his parents, Clifton's troublemaking ways continued. Clifton's parents forced him to go to mental health clinics on a daily basis, where he was given Sorrentil, a drug used to treat schizophrenia, but this didn't help him. By the time he was 13, he was arrested for prank calling an airline, stealing a motorcycle, and breaking into a church. His numerous arrests by 16 let a judge to place him in jail until he was 18. After his release, Clifton tried to make something of his life. He applied to every branch of the armed services, but he was denied. So he turned to making collections for drug dealers in Arizona. In 1989, Clifton and his sister went on a string of robberies in Phoenix holding up a store clerk and several pieces of delivery men. According to later statements, Bloomfield had a gun in every room of his apartment, even in the refrigerator. Both he and his sister were arrested after the police raided his apartment. Clifton was sentenced to 12 years in prison and his sister was sentenced to 10 years. Clifton got two years added on to his sentence for attacking a prison guard with a mop handle. When people try to treat someone like an animal, Two things happen, Clifton said in a prison interview. That person is forced to live under these circumstances of being an animal, or they start fighting back. I learned lessons nobody should have to learn. How to make weapons out of almost anything. You could put me butt naked into a cell and inside of five minutes, I'll have a piece of steel. That's all there is to it. I will never be without my mental faculties. Clifton wrote several prison letters to his father and his sister, but the letters went unanswered. He earned an associate's degree in prison with the help of his aunt, who was a corrections officer. After being released in 2002, he moved to a small home in Rio Rancho, New Mexico. By March 2004, Clifton, by all outward appearances, was living a normal life. He was making good money working at a hotel and for a roofing company. He had even met a woman who had taken him to church and helped him get acclimated to life outside of prison. But this facade would soon end. On October 24, 2005, Clifton walked out of a Fud Ruckers restaurant in Albuquerque off of Interstate 125. At the same time, 37-year-old interior designer Carlos Esquibel was exiting an adult film store next door. According to Bloomfield, Carlos, who was gay, tried to flirt with him. Even though Clifton was heterosexual, he played along and agreed to accompany Carlos back to his apartment. When they went to the bedroom, Clifton violently attacked Carlos, ripping his shirt off. He then twisted the shirt around his neck, strangling him to death. Clifton then placed a box of condoms on his head and stuffed a cloth in his mouth before rummaging through his apartment for valuables and leaving. Carlos's body was found hours later by the landlord. On October 27th, Clifton had gotten into an argument with his girlfriend. He decided that he needed to blow off some steam. He parked his car at a grocery store and started walking around. He then hopped a fence, walking through backyards. That was when he noticed the back door of a house slightly open. The house belonged to 81-year-old Josephine Selvage, a retired school teacher with Alzheimer's disease. She was asleep. There wasn't anyone moving, so I went in, he would later say to police as to why he decided to enter the house. Clifton then put on latex gloves and decided to rummage through a purse that was lying on the kitchen counter. After finding nothing valuable in the purse, he stumbled and almost fell. He then walked down the hallway toward the first bedroom and where he saw jewelry on the dresser. As he went for the jewelry, Josephine woke up screaming and charged at Clifton. He easily overpowered the woman and threw her to the ground. He found a piece of clothing and wrapped it around her neck and pulled tight. However, she managed to get up and Clifton tightened his grip on the makeshift noose. She just kept kicking and screaming. I just held on until she didn't make any noise. 
he would later tell the police. After Josephine was dead, Clifton looked through her jewelry boxes, dresser drawers, and closets, but he left the house empty-handed as nothing interested him. Since the two murders occurred just days apart and were close to each other, police investigated a link, but later incorrectly concluded that the two murders were unrelated. Two months after Josephine's murder, Clifton posed as a potential buyer for a home that belonged to an elderly couple in Los Ranchos. After making small talk with the couple, he drew a gun on them and ordered the couple into their garage, where he took their cash. Afterwards, he tried to propose to his girlfriend, but she rejected him, so he left town. U.S. Marshals caught him in Texas several months later while he was at work for a roofing company. After being extradited back to Albuquerque, he spent 18 months in jail after being let out on a work release program where he had to wear an ankle monitor for 200 days. He used his bad guy prison image to land roles as a movie extra. He played a prison inmate in the 2008 Val Kilmer film Felon and again in To Live and Die. When auditioning for these roles, Bloomfield also claimed to have worked as an actor on Breaking Bad. However, no sources have been able to support this claim. On December 4th, 2007, Clifton prowled through the backyard of a home on the 6900 block of Avenida La Costa. He entered the home through the glass sliding door where the homeowner, 79-year-old Tack Yi, saw him as he walked in. Tack tried to attack Clifton, but he was quickly overpowered and killed. He then stumbled upon Tack's wife, 69-year-old Peng Yi. He tried to strangle her with a belt, but he said it was taking too long, so he suffocated her with a plastic bag. According to Clifton, he had an accomplice that helped him murder the couple, when investigators couldn't find evidence of a second culprit. A few days after the murders, two magazine salesmen were arrested for the killings, but the police couldn't find any evidence to charge them, so they were released. On June 28, 2008, Clifton went with another man, 35-year-old Jason Skaggs, on his revenge plot. Jason had found out that a man only known as Manny had been sleeping with his wife. As the news made Jason enraged, he was desperate for revenge, and he along with Clifton decided to invade Manny's house and kill him in cold blood. However, neither of them knew that their intended target sold the house to Scott and Catherine Pierce days before the murder, which led to a tragic case of mistaken identity. The newlyweds were in bed in the early morning of June 28th when Catherine heard their dogs barking in her yard. She immediately got up to investigate and felt like someone had entered the house. Although Catherine initially believed that it was her husband playing a prank on her, she turned around to find Clifton holding a sawed-off shotgun to her head. Since he he knew what Manny looked like, he was surprised to find a different person in the house. Still, he demanded to know where Manny was, but Catherine insisted that she didn't know anyone by that name. By then, Scott heard the commotion and ran into the room trying to tackle Clifton to the ground. But Clifton was able to get free and shoot Scott once in the neck at close range before running away from the scene. Although Catherine wasted no time attending to her husband's wounds and calling 911, Scott died before first responders could arrive. During the investigation, police officials realized that the intruder was searching for the original homeowner who had sold the home to Catherine and her husband. Once this man was identified as Manny, the police questioned him and learned that Jason Skaggs was the only person who wanted him dead. Jason was brought in for questioning, immediately insisting on his innocence and claimed that he was camping outdoors with his wife on the day of the murder. However, Jason's wife's statement proved that that alibi was fake. After further interrogation, he confessed to the planning of the crime and even led the police to Clifton Bloomfield. When investigators searched Clifton's house, they found a shotgun similar to the one used in the murder, along with a mask and a bulletproof vest, hinting that he was involved with this crime as well. Bloomfield eventually confessed to pulling the trigger, but claimed that Scott was a victim of mistaken identity. This confession helped detectives build a solid case and arrest him and Jason for murder. When the police sent Clifton's DNA in for testing, they were shocked as not only did it connect him to Scott Pierce's murder, but it also proved his involvement in the December 2007 murders of Tack and Pong Yi. His DNA and other forensic evidence also connected him to the October 2005 murders of Carlos Esquibel and Josephine Selvage. Clifton Bloomfield eventually pled guilty to five counts of first-degree murder and was sentenced to 195 years in 2008. Jason Skaggs accepted a plea deal. He pled guilty to criminal solicitation to commit murder, conspiracy to commit aggravated burglary with a deadly weapon, aggravated burglary with a deadly weapon, and second degree murder. As a result, the judge sentenced Jason to 30 and a half years of prison in 2009. On September 23, 2017, 
Rookie Correctional Officer Matt Schreiner patrolled cell block 3's upper tier. His activity that night was captured on the prison security cameras. A few minutes after 9 o'clock p.m., Schreiner was seen pausing at a locked cell. He reached in the door slot and was handed contraband. The young guard then passed the item to another inmate in an adjacent cell. As Schreiner continued to patrol the cell block, he stopped at cell 203, where cameras caught him talking through a locked door to one of the most dangerous inmates in the entire prison system, Clifton Bloomfield. Schreiner exchanged a few words with Clifton and then in blatant disregard for security, unlocked Bloomfield's cell door. Moments later, Clifton rushed Schreiner and overpowered him with a sharpened toothbrush fashioned into a shank. As Schreiner was taken hostage, Bloomfield grabbed his keys and unlocked the cell doors of several other inmates. Schreiner was able to break away where he ran down the steps to the main level, retrieved his walkie-talkie, and ran for help. With keys to the entire 40-man cell block and no guards, the inmates took control. Cell doors were unlocked, and the prisoners went on a brutal rampage. Some prisoners used their newfound freedom to settle scores. One inmate, who was a suspected informant, was assaulted in his cell as his throat was slashed. Other inmates disabled the prison's surveillance cameras. They started a fire and trashed the cell block. The prison's riot response team flooded the cell block with tear gas. Gradually, the security force was able to regain control of the facility. Inmates were rounded up, handcuffed, and escorted one by one to the prison's day room. The inmate who was attacked was found unconscious in a pool of blood. Rescuers drug him out and called an ambulance. Ringleader Clifton Bloomfield was handcuffed, ushered out of the cell block, and was transferred to maximum security at the state pen in Santa Fe. Clifton was always known as a dangerous inmate throughout the prison system. One month before the riot, he nearly strangled another prisoner to death with a towel. Eleven days before the riot, a warden sent an email to prison staff about Clifton's violent nature. We received a note this morning stating inmate Bloomfield wants to harm our staff. All of us know how dangerous this inmate is. Ensure that all precautions are used when dealing with inmate. Ensure that a supervisor and a camera is present when his food tray or his cell door is open. In an interview with Corrections Department investigators, Schreiner admitted to passing notes for inmates. He said he couldn't remember why he unlocked Bloomfield's cell. A month after the riot, Schreiner resigned and moved out of state. I mean, it's like you, like you really had a choice. Perhaps the biggest problem facing this particular prison was understaffing. Correctional officer vacancies at the facility were dangerously inadequate. In September 23, 2017, 20 guards were required to secure the prison. That night, however, only nine were present. Over a two and a half year period, the Department of Corrections fined the Clayton facility over $2.7 million for failure to safely staff the prison. I mean, you could have used that money to hire more prison guards. Like, obviously, this prison has financial problems that they can't hire more guards. So you're going to put them in even more financial struggle because that makes more sense. Like, you're a guard. You're supposed to keep the inmates in check. That's your job. You're passing notes. You're 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 being all buddy-buddy with the inmates. The crazy part, when Clifton says, oh, it, it was a case of mistaken identity when they killed uh, Scott Pierce. My thing is, he already knew that they were at the wrong house. But yet, he still decided to do that. He wanted to kill somebody. Like, there, you can't just, oh, I, I, did, I killed the wrong person. You literally, you went into the house. You knew what this man looked like. You didn't see this man at the house. But yet, you still continued to go in the house and try to rob the place and try to intimidate this woman into telling you, even though you know that this man don't live here. Jason's just as dumb as you. I'm going to kill this guy because he was sleeping with my wife. And now, look at you. You're in prison and he's probably still sleeping with her now. So, like, like you, you, you still lost. Like, come on, man. Like, you still sleeping with your wife, probably, while you in prison. I read an article where the, the director for the movie said that it was not in the budget to do background checks on the extras. Which, I mean, that kind of makes sense, because I'm sure that movie was not, it, they didn't give him a huge budget for the movie. But that's crazy. You've already killed two people, but in the meantime, oh, let me go act in the movie. Let me go be an actor really quick. Even though I just like murdered two people, let me be an actor. That's just so crazy that some people are just able to just shove a portion of their personality to the side and just act normal for a few, for a month or a few months or a year or so what, and then just go back to doing what they've been doing. You can be someone who is violent enough to, to strangle somebody to death and then just act like nothing happened and just star in a movie and then go right back to doing the same thing you were already doing. But this man is in prison where he needs to be. He don't need to be nowhere near no humans. Keep that man in solitary. Thank you for watching. I really appreciate all the support that you guys give this channel. Um, leave a like if you enjoyed. Hit that subscribe button if you're new to my channel. Don't forget to turn on my post notifications if you haven't already. 
Thank you so much. Be safe. Stay on the grind. I'm out. Peace.